The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. I've never inherited a nickel, but I inherited the love of the natural world and a respect, a respect for it. We use helicopters to ferry all the equipment we need to get up there and build the guzzlers high enough up to be utilized by the bighorn sheep. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I was born in Dallas, got to experience the Midwest, the Northeast, quite a few years in Houston. Billy Hassel lives in the urban world. Didn't move back to the area until about 15 years ago, then I've made Fort Worth home ever since. But Billy has always been drawn to the natural world. Abby. It's hard when you live in a city to find places that are natural. It's dog heaven for them, and us too. Reconnecting with nature in a small way, in a very urban environment, it calms the soul somehow if you can slow down. We live fast-paced lives, and we're kind of conditioned, I think, to think we have to live in rush all the time. But follow Billy to work, and his interest in nature becomes most apparent. Here we are in my studio. I'm a full-time artist. My work has always been inspired by nature. I grew up in a time when there were still some open spaces and creeks, and I got to experience a little bit of nature, even though I grew up in a pretty urban environment. I guess my love of nature was born from those experiences, and I've been kind of searching for that throughout the rest of my life. I've been seeking out opportunities to be out in nature and find places to inspire my work. You see these oak groves from a distance, and they are their sort of own little world. In early fall, a new project finds Billy seeking natural inspiration along the coast. This is a cool spot. This might be a spot to come back to and set up a chair in watercolor. Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation has commissioned Billy to create a series of prints celebrating wildlife habitat conservation statewide. We decided on five land projects around the state of Texas, powder horn being kind of the jewel in the crown. Billy's first lithograph will feature Potterhorn Ranch, 17,000 acres of newly conserved coastal prairie and marsh on Matagorda Bay. It's very heartening to me to see large areas of land like this preserved for the future. If you had to put it all into one picture, you couldn't fit it all. That's the challenge. Mm. Prickly pear and a rattlesnake. The more you look, the more you see. <laughs> it is cool to watch them move. I find a lot of inspiration as an artist in a place like this. And as I learn more and more about it, I'm fascinated by the complexities of it and how practically every plant and every little creature plays a role and the overall balance of a place. The 
if I sit down to do a watercolor, I have to sit the chair down, find a spot, commit myself to at least an hour, an hour and a half of time. In a pencil sketch, I can frequently get a, at least a contour of the shadows. The cactus, I got a little more detailed on the shapes, and, and the, the line drawings kind of helped me put it into a bigger context. The length of time it takes to do a watercolor, by the time you're three quarters of the way finished, the light has changed completely. That's the advantage of having a photograph to refer to just for the light and the color. For years, I didn't even own a camera. If I take a picture, I let the camera be the memory, and if I draw it, I think I have to remember it in my head. There's something about the process of visualizing something and processing what you're seeing that burns a more indelible memory. Just being in a place, just walking through a place and hearing the wind blow and seeing things, it seeps in. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. Pick a color, any color. <laughs> One month That's after easy. his field visit, Billy has an image for his print. So I'm here at Peter Webb's shop in Austin where we're turning my drawings into a color lithograph. With his printer, Billy builds the image one color at a time. Everything is by hand. He has to basically take his image, deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it. The artist has to draw each and every plate. He's actually drawing the whole print right here. The drawing is transferred by light onto the plate. Traditionally, lithographs were printed from limestone. Aluminum plates have replaced the limestone, but essentially it's the same process that it's been for 300 years. I hate to call it a dying art form, but I feel like by doing the lithographs, I'm somehow keeping an old process alive. So we could take it out later if... Uh... Oh, did I say Each color is hand <laughs> inked, hand printed, and usually there are about 12 to 15 colors. So that's 15 passes through a press to get one image. All my drawings are done in black and white, so there's this sort of magic thing that happens when we assign colors to each plate and then we combine the colors and we achieve this end result. Each color is printed, one on top of another, and then when all the colors are printed, you have a finished print. It's a one-shot deal. I think it's somehow appropriate to be celebrating these places as a limited edition work of art. Ta-da! <laughs> we did it. There'll be editions of 30, and once they're gone, they're gone. And in a way, it is like the land that's inspiring the prints. Back at his studio in Fort Worth, Billy completes other work to be shown with his lithograph. So I'm working on a group of paintings for a show that's going to open in Fort Worth in a couple of weeks. So I've got a few oil paintings that are in progress. Billy's time at Powderhorn has inspired much more than one print. It's kind of evolved into a, almost a whole show of work based on that. I make my gallery owners a little nervous sometimes because I'm down to the wire usually, but I always deliver. <laughs> We're at the William Campbell Contemporary Art Gallery here in Fort Worth. Wonderful show. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Tonight is the opening of a show of new paintings and the unveiling of the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. This has generated quite a stir. Pulled in the crowd tonight. 
This is kind of the culmination of uh, weeks of work and sweat and anxiety over getting it all done in time. And my only anxiety now is uh, that there's not any wet paint that anybody's going to bump into inside there. I like the one in the back. It's powerful. Paintings have sold and prints have sold and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. And I do think people make the association or think about the coastal prairie of Texas and also the fragility of nature. While preserving nature in paint and ink has a beauty all its own, proceeds from Billy's print will also help Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation keep places like Powderhorn Ranch wild forever. When this was proposed to me, I was thrilled. With more lithographs in the series, it'll be about a three-year project. Billy Hassel has more natural inspiration to look forward to. I hope that the prints reach people and make people aware of Powderhorn, but also just aware of the world and how precious it is. Fifty years ago, you couldn't hardly walk through this place. It was wall-to-wall -wall brush. There wasn't any grass. There wasn't any water. Nobody wanted it. On the truck. On the truck. He's the finest dog in the United States of America. <laughs> yeah, in Texas, too. <laughs> well, I was born uh, in Ohio, born into poverty, to be honest about it. I lived out in the country amongst the uh, Amish people. So I really got my life example set for me by my own mother. That's where my love of the natural world came from. I've never inherited a nickel, but I inherited a love of the natural world and a respect, a respect for it. When I got out of the university, I took a job. I sold vacuum cleaners door to door. I went into the uh, fast food business. I've teamed up with a young man, Bill Church, and it was Church's Fried Chicken. And we built that company up to over 1,600 stores and we sold it. And with that capital, I was able to come here and begin my work on Sela, the Hamburger Ranch Preserve. My objective was to take the worst piece of land I could possibly find in the hill country of Texas and begin a process of restoration that would change it back to be one of the best and that has happened right here by habitat restoration, by working with Mother Nature instead of against her, and that's what we're all about. 46 years ago, not a drop of water. Seven water wells were drilled, 500 foot deep. Not a one produced any water. The top 125 foot of these hills looks like this. It's Edwards Limestone. When the driller drilled all those wells for me, he said, Ben Berger, there's one place up here on the top, my bit dropped 40 foot. He said, you've got a cavern under there. It's like an auditorium. The only thing about it was, 46 years ago, it had no water in it. It was dry. It was dry because the water that was coming in was running off as opposed to sinking in. When I came here, all of the little holes and all of that limestone were just as dry as the one I'm holding in my hand. Now what happened? We replaced that condition with this condition in two and a half years. After we began, the first spring came to life. Mm -hmm. 
As we continued on, another spring showed up. We got up to where we had 11. Where'd the water come from? It came out of all of that hose in that perched aquifer like that. That's where it come from. It was stored in the earth and all because of one thing, just one. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna show you the greatest conservation tool ever made and everything I talk about could not have happened without grass. The hill country is just covered with woody species. Primarily, it's uh, cedar. We took out a great portion of it here on the ranch. We were just covered with it. We had no grass. When we took out the cedar and spread native grass seeds and it began to grow, rainfall then percolated into the earth because of the root system of grass going down. Water percolates and it fills up your aquifer until the aquifer is full and when it's full, it has to come out somewhere and they call that a spring. That spring supplied water for all the nature's critters, plus for all the families that live here and it even sends water downstream to the city of Austin. Now what does it cost? Our governments and governments all around the world are spending millions and millions of dollars doing all kinds of things, dams and reservoirs and pipelines and all of this can be done by you and I. We don't have to have government. We can't expect government to do it all anyway. But if we do have some conservation ethics, the results are mind-boggling. Now, do we see that kind of erosion here? I'm telling you, truthfully, I've seen this property and the experiences that people have here change lives. What does Sila mean? Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. What does Sila mean? When I was younger, I discovered in the Psalms the word Selah. It means to stop, to pause, to look around you and reflect on everything you see. To me, it's like Thoreau was to Walden Pond gives us a chance to say, what's my duty as a steward of this ranch land? And I believe it's to take care of it and to share it. And if you don't share what you have, you're gonna live a lonely life. That is a necessary ingredient for every human being that we need to catch up and live amongst Mother Nature and learn to appreciate her for what she really is. I've given this land to a foundation. It'll go on in perpetuity. It'll never be any different than you see it today. When I leave this world, that's what I want as part of my legacy. Out here in the mountains of West Texas, you will find a rare animal. Desert bighorn sheep at one time completely disappeared from this region. Historically, the native Texas desert bighorn sheep occurred in about 16 mountain ranges out here in, in the Trans-Pecos, mainly due to uh, unregulated hunting, diseases associated with the introduction of domestic sheep and goats, and net wire fencing. Uh, they brought the demise of, of the desert bighorn, and by the early 1960s, they were, they were gone. They were all gone from Texas. Come on, bighorn. Okay. But the bighorn has made a comeback. Recent restoration efforts have brought a healthy bighorn population back to its native home. 
One key factor for the survival of the restored bighorn population is access to water. Water is scarce in these arid mountains, but there is a way to ensure the bighorn has enough to drink with a man-made watering hole called a guzzler. A guzzler is essentially a rainwater collection system for wildlife. We've got two large panels of sheet metal that collect the rainwater, funnel that down into storage tanks that feed two wildlife-friendly watering stations. These watering stations play a big role in bighorn sheep restoration, and they also provide for any thirsty critter that comes along. But it's no easy task getting a guzzler going. Uh, safety things on the bird. We do want you to duck a little bit. So all you tall guys got to be careful because you're tall and... and won't be. Yeah, don't ever raise your hand. <laughs> hey, see you later. <laughs> on this spring weekend, the Texas Bighorn Society has gathered at Black Gap Wildlife Management Area for a work project. These work projects normally last a couple of days and they're always in extremely remote areas. For this work project, we've had over 100 people here to help us build two water catchment devices we call guzzlers. Black Gap weren't already remote enough, the workers must travel by helicopter to the mountaintops where the guzzlers will be constructed. We use helicopters to ferry all the equipment we need to get up there and build the guzzlers high enough up to be utilized by the bighorn sheep. tanks anchored down, the troughs in place. I think all we have left to do now is put tin on, run our fast line to our troughs and plumb everything in. That looks good. Uh, it's a hands-on organization. I brought uh, my son and his friend so they could see what real conservation is. And we've been doing it a couple of years now. And he's a junior in high school and he'll be able to take this as a lifetime event for him. Now we need to get over there and proceed. By the end of the day, this team has completed their mission, leaving behind their mark on this mountain. And after a scenic ride back to camp, they're rewarded with a well-earned feast among friends. Are you, are you in the way? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Before the weekend is done, the group is already collecting funds for the next effort. I got 200. Can I have two and a half? Two and a half. I got three. I got three. Three, three, three. I need three. I have 306 U.S. dollars right over here. Yeah. Yeah. This land is suitable for all the game that live here. It was missing one thing, water. And now it'll have water. That's conservation right there. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.